May the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. When I was younger, my mom used to say that my brother and I were joined at the hip. Obviously, she wasn't speaking literally, but we were inseparable. We would eat together, we would sleep in the same room together, we would play together, we would get into trouble together. We, were, we did everything together. But not, we weren't quite as inseparable as Chan and N. Bunker. You may not know their names unless you've done a little bit of research into conjoined twins, but Chan and N. Bunker were, from the 1800s, part of the P.T. Barnum Circus. They were conjoined twins. They were joined at the liver and at the torso. And as it was rare in the 1800s, it's still rare today. But as inseparable as my brother and I were, we weren't nearly as inseparable as these two brothers are, or as any two brothers or sisters are who are conjoined. Well, scientists still don't know exactly how conjoined twins come about. You, st you still hear about them, and you still hear about sometimes them living till adulthood. But speaking of that, can you imagine being conjoined to someone else? Can you imagine your entire life, every waking and every sleeping moment, being with someone? Not a moment of privacy. Husbands and wives, think about it for just a minute. Can you imagine spending every waking and every sleeping moment with your spouse? Well, I can't. How about parents with you and your children? Can you imagine spending every moment of every day with your children or children with your parents? No, uh, we'd have a lot more probably fatalities, wouldn't we? No, we, can, we, don't, we can't hardly imagine that, can we? We can't hardly imagine constantly spending every moment with someone else, constantly being in the same presence. We can't imagine it because we've grown up pretty independent, haven't we? Self-sufficient. We like to live on our own. We like to do things on our own. We like to be independent. We like to be a people who don't ask for help. Think about it. Even for those of you who need help today, you still have things that you grasp for independence for, things that you don't want to have taken away from you. I know for one, for one thing, it's hard when you lose your driver's license. When you're no longer able to drive, you feel like you've lost some of your independence. And I'm sure as you think about your own life, you know there's places where you've lost some of the independence you once had. It's part of what, growing up, part of getting older, isn't it? But that's hard for us. And it's especially hard to think about losing our independence or not having any independence when it comes to the promise of salvation. So often we as Christians, so often we as people, we, want to be we don't want to be dependent. We want to be independent. We want to be able to do things on our own. And so when we look at faith, when we look at the promise of salvation, we struggle with that, even as Christians all of our lives. We want there to be something we can do. We want to be able to make a decision or accept Christ. We want to be able to decide for him. But the truth is, we can't choose Christ because he chose us. We can't choose Christ because we were dead in our trespasses when he chose us. It was only by the power of his Holy Spirit coming into our hearts that we could have faith. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, probably a very familiar verse for most of, most of you, there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely, freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What a promise we have. What a promise we have that it was a free gift from God. Not something that we chose or decided for. But that's where the struggle comes in, isn't it? Because we want to have some kind of involvement. We want to have some kind of part in it. We want to take hold of it. But His Spirit has given it to us. And oh, what a wonderful thing that is. Oh, what a wonderful promise that we have. Because God has given it to us despite who we are despite who we've been, despite where we are going. God is not blind to our sinfulness. He's not blind to the fact that we continue to sin. But He still gives us that promise of salvation. And that is what unites the church. When we look at Ephesians three and, or Ephesians 4, I encourage you to open up your bulletins to that. Because Ephesians 4, Paul talks about this. Not as people who are simply thrown together, but as a body. A body united in Christ. A body united by common faith. And when we talk about this, we talk about this as the invisible church. Dr. C.F.W. Walther, who was the first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, he made a distinction between the visible church and the invisible church. Things that we know and we, have, we realize, but maybe we, the language we don't always use. But he speaks about the visible church. He's talking about our congregation. 
Grace Lutheran Church or St. Mary's Catholic Church, Valley Baptist Church, First Church of the Nazarene, United Methodist Church, and so on. And in the visible church, there are both believers and non-believers. On a Sunday morning, on any day of the week, when, pe- when believers come together, we don't know if it's all believers or if there are unbelievers present. We don't know that because we don't judge the heart. And this is what we mean when we say the visible church. But we are all part of the invisible church. Those who believe are part of God's invisible church, united together in the body of Christ. And the invisible church, it refers to every tribe, every nation, every tongue of Christian people. It refers to people who speak different language than us, who have different color skin than us. It refers to people who have different ancestries than us, people who have different ways of life than us. When we talk about the invisible church, it won't even fit in the largest building on earth because God's invisible church stretches from one corner of the globe to the other. However, when we talk about this invisible, indivisible, invisible church, there we go, when we talk about this church united by the body of Christ, there are signs of it in the world. As Walter writes in his fifth thesis, although the true church in the proper sense of the term is invisible as to its essence, Yet its presence is perceivable, its marks being pure, the pure teaching of the word of God and the administration of the holy sacraments in accordance with their institution by Christ. We have signs of the church among us. We have signs of the church everywhere we go. The church is not, even though it is invisible, we as believers, we bring the church to the people who are outside. We bring the church to the people who are blind to see. As we live out, as we live out, our promise as we are live out our faith. We bring the church of God to the people who are lost and dying. And this is a big task. This is a big call because as people, we, so, we are so caught up in our independence that we struggle with this. As people, we are so caught up in doing it on our own that we focus on our numbers, on what our church is doing instead of seeing that church is not just one visible building but stretches across denominational lines. It stretches across common teaching, that common teaching that Jesus Christ is Savior. Now, this is not to say for a minute that that as a Lutheran church that we're teaching something wrong here. Don't get me wrong, because I believe, and I am a Lutheran pastor for a reason. I believe that we have a proper interpretation of Scripture, interpreting Scripture. But we as the people of God, we are also called to share the gospel. We as the people of God are not bound up in one building and one denomination, but we as the people of God stretch across the, uh, the, uh, around the world and across these buildings. And that is important. And that is important because today in this day and age, there's a war going on. There's a war going on between Christians and non-Christians. And we don't like to talk about it this way because we preach a message of tolerance. We don't like to talk about it this way because of the fact that when we say tolerance and we say we have to talk about intolerance, but there's a war going on. There's a war going on that, is a te- that Satan is leading against the church. We don't have enemies in the world, but as Paul talks about just a, la- a little later in Ephesians 6, we have one enemy, and that is Satan. But we as the church, we as a church, we need to get out from behind the church walls. We need to get out from behind our quarrels and our squabbles. The small things that are, that are well, I'm going to say it, are petty. The small things that we, are, that we are forget, that lead us to look inside instead of outside. We as the people of God, we are called to proclaim the message. We as the people of God are called to be the body of Christ, dependent on one another whether we're a mini church or a mega church, whether we're a rural church or an urban church, whether we are churches of all one denomination or churches of one community, we are called together to be that body of Christ, to preach that message to a people lost and dying, to preach that message to people who have lost their faith, to preach that message to people who have never heard that faith. We have been called together to make sacrifices in our own lives, so that others might hear the gospel. But this is hard for us as people because we don't like to sacrifice. We get caught up in ourselves and we get caught up in what we want. Our pride gets in our way. Our self-sufficiency gets in our way. And instead of, instead of being a people, going out, sharing the gospel, we're a people caught up in ourselves. Paul starts off our, our, our epistle today 
with some simple words. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, here, bearing with one another in love. That's hard though, isn't it? To be completely humble and to be completely gentle. To bear with one another in love. Because that means that we do sacrifice. That means that we do admit that sometimes we are wrong. That means that when we look at other people and we see their faults and errors, that sometimes we will have to correct those things. That we do have to correct those things. But we have to do so speaking the truth in love. Because just a little later, as, he clo- as we closed our epistle today, he said, Speak the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. See, when we look outside ourselves, we see that we don't have to do it all ourselves because that is an overwhelming task. When we look at the war, when we look at the battlefront, if we try to take it on ourselves, we're going to lose. Don't get me wrong, the power of God is powerful and it is all-powerful. But he is also uniting us together to work together. He is also calling us to work together. And he is, go- and he is empowering us and strengthening us. But when we are quibbling and we are forcing, focusing on our own quarrels, we're not turning to the cross, are we? We're not turning to the power of God, are we? We're turning to our human nature. See, God isn't about making one church grow. He's not about making, well, I'll fix that in a second. He's not about making one denomination larger than others. But when God is talking about making his kingdom grow on this earth, he's talking about his invisible church. That is the church of all people, of all denominations, all who hold to this one true faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. All who hold to the promise of faith that there is only one way to salvation, and that is Jesus. And that is what unites us. That is what links us together. That is the marrow that holds our bones together. That is the marrow that holds us together in our faith, the tendon. Because when we try to do it on our own, when we try to do it outside of Christ, we fail, we flop. Because outside of Christ, we are dead in our sins and we are dead in our trespasses. It is only by the power of Christ in our lives, by the power of his victory over death and sin on the cross, that we too may have power, that we may too may be strengthened, that we too may defeat the devil in this world. And yes, we do have the power to do that. Yes, through the power of Christ living in each one of us, we do have the power to defeat sin, death, and the devil. We too, working together, have that power. So often, so often it seems overwhelming because we hear about the continued movements against the church. We continue about hearing about people who not only turn their back on the church, but are completely rejecting Christ. So often we hear about people who grew up in the church, but decided that they didn't need the church, didn't need Christ any longer. Well, our God has a different message. Our God has a message of power and a message of hope. Our God has a message. And that message is one of salvation. That message is, I forgive you. I forgive you no matter where you are, no matter what you've done. I forgive you no matter how far you have strayed from the faith. I forgive you and I call you back. Because our God, he looks beyond the physical world. He looks beyond the visible church. And he looks into our hearts. And together, together he calls us to preach and proclaim his word. Notice Paul didn't say there was one path. But as he went through, there are preachers and there are teachers, there are theologians, there are doctors of the faith, there are there are lay people, people who are sharing their faith in the communities they're at, they're, they are in right now. That is who God has called us to be. That is who God has united us together to be. Not a people who are independent, but a people who are conjoined to him, conjoined to him in heart and faith, that we may look beyond the, this church, these church walls, that we may see a people not for who we think they are, but who God, how God sees them. A people who are in need of that hope. A people who are in need of that forgiveness. A people who we were at one time. Because each of us were separated from Christ. Each of us at one time were separated from salvation. Until Christ, the Holy Spirit changed our hearts. Until the Holy Spirit called us and made us his own. 
And that is the message we have to proclaim. That is the message that we go, un- that we go forth under the banner of. That is the message that we as a church, invisible church on earth, proclaim to the world. And that is the message that will not fail. That is the message of hope, and that is the message that one day we'll be with our Lord forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for your holy word. We give thanks to you that you have come and you have called us, that you have broken down the the dependence, the independence we have in this life, and that you have made us dependent on you. But Lord, let us not see that as a weakness. But let us see that as the strength that it is. Lord, help us to depend on you in all that we say and do. Help us to depend on you because we know that only through you, only through you, you can take the dead and make it alive. Only through you, you can defeat sin and death in our lives. Only through you do we have the power to proclaim that message to the world. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and direct us. We pray that you would strengthen us, that you would support us. We pray that we would always look to you with the hope and the assurance that you have defeated death and that one day we will rise with you on the last day. Until that day comes, Lord, may your peace be with us. May it bind us together. And may your strength support us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.